it, it can get kind of tricky and confusing with all the federal regulations and national consensus-based standards that are out there, uh, state codes when it comes to being safe and working and or doing rescue at heights. And we're just going to do a quick rundown of all the nitty-gritty stuff. Because you can try to read this and interpret this, but it takes quite a while and it's pretty boring reading through that kind of stuff. So what I'm going to do here is try to build some sort of parallelisms between where most ski patrollers kind of come from, like recreational style stuff, and kind of draw a parallelism to the work at heights industry, fall protection, and just rope rescue. This is going to be rooted in principles to show you that the principles really are the same. We can't ignore OSHA because all the stuff really is, is falls under that. And so it's like OSHA is like that thing where you can add to with the standards and the techniques, but you can't take away, and that's what OSHA is. So we're combining uh, OSHA 29 CFR 1910 subparts D and I, so that's working at height. It's fall protection. Uh, specifically, we're going over personal fall protection systems. So we're gonna throw that in a pot. We're also, we're also gonna throw the ASSP Z359 fall protection code, and Z slash ASSP. We're also throwing in uh, NFPA stuff, NFPA tower rescue, NFPA rope rescue standards, 1006. We're also gonna throw in rope access principles, SPRAT, which also adheres to those ASSP things. Um, and you can argue that we're also incorporating NATE, the NAT, National Association of Tower Rectors, they're called something else now, but like, all, if you take all those standards and ANSI NSAA B77.1 standard for aerial ropeways, there's also a guide, a resource guide, the Aerial Evacuation Resource Guide for uh, chairlifts. That was like a joint publication and they had some uh, outside help too. Harkin's heavily involved with that, Cascade Rescue, Elevated Safety, Harkin, that whole thing. So if, if we throw all that stuff into a pot and then cook it down and we spit it out, like this should hopefully like resonate. Okay, so we'll start with recreational rock climbing, whether you're like leading a sport route or trad route or, or, or top roping. There's a principle on this whole thing and it's a primary means of support from falling as well as a backup. When we say backup, in rock climbing, it's, it's a belay line, a dynamic rope that's your belay. And it's no different in the industrial side of the work at heights stuff. We typically call it fall arrest, some sort of fall arrest system or backup system. So all those words mean the same thing. And you can imagine that if I'm a rock climber, my primary means of support are going to be, is going to be my body, my hands and my feet as I climb this rock wall. And I, I need, so that's one, I need a backup and that's my belay line. So if we move away from the recreational industry and go to like tower climbing, well, the, the ladder is my, my face. And so it's the same thing. I have my hands and feet are, are climbing the ladder, but I need a backup or something that's gonna catch me if I fall. Okay, so let's talk about what qualifies and what doesn't. What I have here is a, basically it's like a static lanyard. They call them green on lanyards right here. If I was climbing this and this is all I had, if I took a fall, this, this does not qualify for fall arrest because there's no shock absorbing energy in this that's going to absorb the impact forces associated with that fall. So this doesn't qualify. The term fall protection on the big picture scale can be diluted down into a subcategory called personal fall protection systems. And even in that personal fall protection system realm, we can further dilute it down. You could argue that there are five, four to five categories. Those categories being personal fall restraint, personal fall arrest, work positioning. With work positioning, you also need a personal fall arrest system in conjunction with. The fourth one being rope descent systems, which doesn't really have much applicability here. And the fifth one, which I don't know if it's official or not, but this whole thing called rope access, the rope access discipline, which is basically a suspension system where you have your primary support and then the backup. Similar to like work positioning, but you can go up and down on a rope. Um, so this does not satisfy uh, that requirement. So what does satisfy is some sort of lanyard that has a shock absorber. So, so this absorbica, uh, these things will deploy anywhere between 650 to 780 pounds of force, impact force, and that will help dissipate the forces. Now the question is, can I get away with resting on this? You can imagine if this was a shorter lanyard and I wanted to go hands-free and rest on it, this fall, this personal fall rest lanyard no longer qualifies because it becomes my primary support. And it's no longer serving as a fall arrest lanyard. It's serving as a, as a positioning lanyard. And now I need a fall arrest system in addition to. 
So rather than relying on something like this to, to hold me as I rest, that's where the work positioning lanyards come in, like Grillon lanyards or any acceptable lanyard. And now I can wait and go hands free off of this ladder. And my primary support is no longer my hands and feet. My backup is on follow rest lander. In this case, a Y Absorbica. When we're doing work or rescue, and this is pretty universal, especially on lift towers, well, we need a full body harness that has an acceptable rated follow rest point. That, that's a non-negotiable. Even if it's an emergency, we can't get away with just a seat harness. We, get, we have to use a full body harness. And, and that's in every standard. That's also in the NSAA aerial evac resource guide. But I have two connection point options. Sternal, I can connect into something short, like a, this is also a fall arrest device, but it's purpose built like a ladder cable grab device. I can connect this, this into my sternal because the total potential for a fall is less than two feet. So I can get away with that. Also, these are designed so that no more than nine inches of, of distance from connection to connection uh, on those. I could not get away with th this uh, Y tie back absorber lanyard is about six feet really. And I can't get away with hooking this end of my sternal point because that introduces a potential fall of greater than two feet. So if I'm using something like this to climb a ladder, it's gotta be in my dorsal. I can't put it on my sternal. But I can put the ladder cable grab. So, six foot max, max free fall distance on the dorsal and two foot max free fall distance on the sternal. I'm gonna talk about these wide absorber lanyards. I, I don't need to connect both of them at the same time to design so that I could progress one after the other. When you're climbing, I wanna make sure that this lanyard is not under my armpit when I'm climbing. I want this to be free so that if I do fall, it doesn't get tangled up around my body. Also, when I alternate, I don't want to just take the, the one I'm not using and clip it to my, or connect it directly into my harness. Because in theory, what that's going to do is if I connect this into my harness and then the other one is anchored and I fall, as I fall and this stitching deploys, this shock absorber deploys, it'll only, and this is connected to my harness, that shock absorber will only deploy so far until it's integrated to my, the connector on my harness. And then the shock absorber will no longer work. And the, and the residual impact force is gonna be on me. So I defeat the ability for the actual energy absorber to do its job. So that's one thing. Also, as I systematically progress, um, I wanna avoid uh, putting uh, the Y lanyards on each side of my shoulder. I, I just wanna stick to one side for both lanyards as I progress. Um, that'll keep the potential for kind of adverse effects on my body it will mitigate that. So I want to just stay to one side or the other, left or right. So there's some debate on where I should connect on this. So everything here is engineered and manufactured designed. Do I connect on the rung or do I connect on the rail? Depends on the kind of connector that you're using. Some of these hooks are designed to be able to, to withstand an impact force on the side, side loading. So that's a plus. I don't know if these are or not, but um, the argument for the rail is if the rung fails and I'm connected into the rung, then I lose my arrest lanyard completely. But if something happens and I fall, the rail is the strongest point. Or if this rung fails, I don't know why it would, <laughs> but it's still attached to the structure. I'm not gonna die on that hill. Like either way is acceptable. That's fine. So. If I'm, at, if I'm gonna be at a height greater than in general industry, which is where we're at, if it's greater than four feet off of a lower level or the surface of the ground, I, I need fall protection. So as I climb up, notice where the connector is on my back. It's on my dorsal. And if I climb up and now the connector is level with my dorsal, if I go above, I could sustain the potential to have a greater than six foot free fall. So this is a no-go. Um, so as I climb up, I want to spot this and hook the next one up higher before I disconnect this so that I continuously maintain the anchors to the structure at or above the level of my connector on my harness. So in this case, the dorsal. Given the choice between the two, I'm going to go for the ladder cable grab every time because this will arrest my fall in a shorter distance than these y lanyards, And it's kind of like a fall sense of security thinking that Oh yeah, if I fall, this is going to protect me. Because let's think about the reality is not really until you're probably like 18 to 20 feet off the deck. And you got to do the math on this, but 
if this is a six foot uh, lanyard and I fall where this connector is at the level of my dorsal connection, I will fall six feet. So, but there's the, the fall of six feet plus uh, the about three and a half foot of tear of the shock absorber that has to elongate. Plus there's gonna be some stretch in my harness. Plus if I'm a six foot tall person, my, my feet are gonna hit the ground before I impact. If you, if you add all those numbers together, these Y lanyards really don't fully protect you if you fall until you're probably, worst case, maybe 18 to 20 feet up. So it's kind of like this false sense of security, even though we are abiding by the regulations and standards. So therefore, I'm gonna choose ladder cable grab. Okay, let's talk about work positioning systems. They don't necessarily have to be the Grion. The Grion's nice because you can actually descend too with it, so it's multifunctional. But it's designed for work positioning. I can also use this as fall restraint. We'll talk about that when we get up to the top. Um, but uh, I can rest and be suspended on my work positioning lanyard and still have my back up in place. Um, I can also rest in another way. And that's where like your side tie-in rings on your harness come into play. If I wanted to wrap around a structure, so if you didn't have a ladder to, to hook into, you could wrap around the structure just like this. Can you see that? I'm using my, my positioning side tie-in points to wrap around and secure me. I can do work like this. Uh, I'm suspend, uh, I'm, my primary means of connection are actually here, not my feet. Um, and I still have my back up. And I'm within regulation standards, etc. Okay, let's talk about transitions onto the platform. So I didn't go up with the lad safe. Um, if I do, I'd, I'd want like a work positioning or a fall restraint lanyard in conjunction with that lad safe because the lad safe only gets me up to the top. It doesn't protect me when I'm on the platform. Uh, however, the, uh, the absorbable Y lanyard will offer me that sort of adjustability. So here, this is the top rung and I've connected into a structural member um, of the tower with the next sequence. Um, it's a little dicey. You do the best you can. There's a spirit of the law with OSHA and then the leather of the law. Um, and right now we're operating in the spirit of the law because right here, there's no way, there's, my options aren't very good. I'm going above the level of connection on my dorsal. So if I fall here, I'm going to take a greater than six foot free fall. But there's no other way around it. We recognize that. And we just want to be extra careful. But when I am to this point, I can just clip in right there, and now I'm good. And I can remove this and come up. Okay, since I clipped in here, I gotta like finagle away to continue that connection. So I'll do that and move the other one. But this still, once I'm up on the tower, we have some guardrails that are engineered and designed, but we can still fall. This is low it's not on my dorsal so i want to get this higher up and it depends on what kind of y lanyard you have um this one has the y tie back so i can wrap around very large structures and back on itself just like that and be okay and i'm good to go i can do whatever i need to do up here from here on out this i can even clip directly to itself and it'll be fine because as long as this is not connected directly to my harness that's all that matters so that's fine i can just let that sit what I could do if I had the, uh, the ladder cable grab and the grion. So as I come up on this ladder cable grab, I have to get to this point. And once I'm here, I don't want to disconnect off of this until I made a connection onto the structure. So I want to connect as high as possible on the biggest bomber stuff we have. In this case, it's this big cross member right here. And so when I hook a lanyard, and it doesn't have to be a grion lanyard, it can be something else that's appropriate, but what I don't want to do is clip in and then choke it up because these weren't meant to be side loaded. Um, a quick way to kind of do this is to create a loop here, a butterfly or a clove hitch, constrictor hitch, whatever. You do, if you look there, that's your Italian hitch. And now I can adjust, cinch this up a little bit, pull that through, and it's not going anywhere. I, I don't need the fall arrest lanyard and a fall restraint lanyard at the same time um, if I'm using them correctly. Um, so I don't really need this. If I have my fall rest lanyard, I can go anywhere else I want to. This can be slack. That's fine. If, I, if I'm not using this, and I'm not connected on my fall rest lanyard, I can get away with a, a fall restraint lanyard 
as long as I maintain semi-taut tension on this because these are designed to prevent you from falling. So uh, a big loop here, that slack is a no-go. Or like a piece of webbing that's just hard tied and you put it to your harness, that's also a no-go. You want something that's adjustable that you can maintain tension from taut to semi-taut. And that is a fall restraint lanyard, also known as travel restrict, travel restraint. It all means the same thing. Uh, again, I want this to be anchored up high. On the, off, on the fall restraint lanyard, I can go directly to my ventral ring. Uh, that's fine. I can also go to sturdle if I want to. I know these are dedicated for fall rest attachment points, but this is fine too. There's nothing against putting a working line here if you want to, um, and that's perfectly fine. Those are just various ways to climb a ladder uh, safely, transition onto the platform, secure yourself when you're on the platform, and doing it in a way that conforms to all those federal regulations as well as state codes that support that, national consensus-based standards, uh, resource guides that they publish, the Aerial Evac Resource Guide. You can read all about that. It echoes the exact same thing that we just talked about here. So hopefully that demuddies the water because trying to read all that and interpret it uh, can take a long time. So hopefully you found the video informative and there you go.